Some people feel their loneliness more than others. They seem to be anchored in an undertow which repels anything vaguely familiar so that their only contact is with the unpredictable and the unexpected. When they come into contact with these things, they are hurled like sparks from a volcano. The emptier and lonelier they feel, the greater the possibility that they will disintegrate instantly or attain fulfillment and find their determination and, yes, even happiness. I'd like to tell you about this so that you can shoulder the burden when the days seem dark and unbearable and when the minutes last forever. Close your eyes and follow me. In the beginning, all was everything and everything was all. Everything was together in its entirety and was still one. Everything was permeated with itself and all was connected to the whole. Everything had endless ways of transforming itself. Everything was free in form, color, and being. Mountains spat out fire, a fire that was so strong and bright, straight from the heart of hot earth, where even today everything glows red. It was sheer bliss watching these flames. They had their own driving force. They looked around, and on discovering water, they were irresistibly drawn towards it, diving into it and sinking. The flames were not extinguished because the elements had not yet begun to fight with each other. There was no such thing as winner or loser. These flames merged with the water and from this union were born the various kinds of mermaids, sea nymphs, sirens, and other water life. Their parents were fire and water. I would like to tell you about one particular member of the mermaid kind. Her childhood resembled a wild and tangled chain of pearls with knots made of dreams, images, and fantasy. Lying on her favorite seashell, daydreaming, she let these pearls slip through her fingers. Was what she saw as her eyes twinkled in the light reality? Or was it a dream? Or was it some intimate dance of the two? The tide of symphonic existence pulsed through her and flooded her with contentment. She even had a friend, the dolphin. He sought her company. She sought his. It was wonderful. Because of this friendship, she was never really taken seriously by the other mermaids and sea nymphs. She did not belong to them. One day she noticed something especially strange going on. There was a lot of whispering, and there were meaningful glances. And now and then, she caught the sound of the word, plagues. She observed how a sea nymph tore herself away from the crowd and swam towards the sea witch's cave. Burning with curiosity, the mermaid followed her. She swam for miles, but suddenly the sea nymph had disappeared and all she could hear was the sound of her voice pleading. Please give me legs. Oh, please. The answer was strange. 
for it seemed to come from within the mermaid herself, saying, If I do, then every step will cause you pain. You will be struck speechless, and within the year will have to marry. All this was much too much for our little mermaid. She did not understand. Everything grew dark in front of her eyes, and she floated through the currents like a drifting piece of seaweed. She had disappeared for quite some time, and no one could have been happier than the dolphin when he finally found her. He poked and nudged her until she smiled again, and soon they were swimming together in familiar waters. He noticed she had changed. He sensed she was keeping a secret. But he felt sure that one day she would confide in him, for there was no one else she could turn to. And above all, he was her friend. But that was exactly the trouble. She dreaded getting him involved, and instead she went first to an elderly sea nymph who she knew only by sight. As casually as she could, she asked as if in passing, Hello. <laughs> by the way, um, what is legs? The sea nymph, who was busy sorting out her shell necklaces for the next festivities, turned abruptly around. Her eyes grew as round as saucers, and her brow developed a hard frown, her mouth stiffening like a sea urchin's. Legs? Well, I never. How imponderable! What impertinence! What imputation! Where in all the waters did you pick that word up? It's not fit for young girls' ears. These times we live in, I mean, really. Suddenly, her face relaxed into a rather silly mask, and she swam off with her nose in the air as if she'd never been asked. Actually, the mermaid had not really expected any other reaction from her. In fact, it only confirmed that something had eluded her, or until now had been kept secret or hidden from her. She asked the fishes. An entire school stopped in its tracks for a moment. Approximately 123 pairs of fishes' eyes stared at her simultaneously. And as if from one mouth, they spoke these words in unison. Legs, schmakes, forget it. And they swam off as if they'd never been asked. She let herself drift down to the octopuses, who, although apparently very trustworthy and friendly, could, if they felt like it, be extremely arrogant and snobbish. She tried asking again, as casually as possible, have you by any chance ever seen legs? But she did not manage to get any further because, as soon as she asked, they started making ridiculous faces, knotting their tentacles together in the craziest fashion. They rolled their eyes stupidly around in their heads, changing all kinds of colors at the same time. Then, in the most discordant fashion, they began to sing. and every one, 
everyone seemed to know much more than she did. Then it suddenly occurred to her she would not yet asked her friend, the dolphin. She found him, looked at him, and said just one word, legs. Immediately understanding, he answered, Come. He led her to a region where she'd never been before. It became rockier, and there were lots of fish and plants. Then he surfaced. He looked, and she followed his gaze to where a young fisherman was standing in his boat. And at once, she knew with every sinew of her body what legs were. Everything that had happened the day before came back to her like an echo. Legs. Pain. Speechlessness. Marriage. Not suitable for little girls' ears. And just like an echo, it faded and she felt embraced by the richness of her world and she became aware of herself of the small waves rocking her of her friend's closeness and of the warm rays of the sun in a state of pure bliss she let herself drift down until she landed on her favorite giant seashell, which bobbed gently up and down. A smile came across her lips, the smile of a young girl who now believed she knew. So, that's it. That's what all the fuss is about. She exclaimed. She felt so relieved. The fish, the octopuses and the old sea nymph. What a fuss. All because of legs. She felt very grown up and stretched herself out on her giant shell and began humming softly to herself. suddenly could not help but notice that since her explorations, the mermaid tended to be a little too frolicsome, and he also observed that she went swimming regularly into that bay. Without any warning, she would suddenly go racing off at any time of day and night, as if some strength within her had melted, or as if she could no longer resist the calling. Usually, she returned, indifferent and looking bored. Occasionally, she had that kind of look that is directed inward rather than outward, and this disturbed him. One day, she was once again lingering about the bay, swimming idly around the fishing boat where her fisherman was working, sitting there, humming and dreaming. She loved listening to his voice so very much. He created a symphonic dream within her. A dream in which she was safely lounging on her favorite seashell, just listening to his voice. With the sun behind her, she slid dreamingly close to him. It was a closeness that exceeds the closeness in dreams. It was that kind of closeness that you could only experience with a human being. 
And suddenly, it had already happened. She was caught in his net. He then pulled it in quickly and surely, this chattering, serpentine thing. He reached out, and he did not know what for. It tried to disentangle itself again and again. Suddenly, there they were, eye to eye. For a split second, she let herself sink into his arms, feeling his skin, his warmth, his smell, and the glimmer in his eyes. A thousand sparks fired within her. She pulled herself away and rolled like a pearl into the water and vanished out of his sight. When she had reached a safe distance, she turned around so she could see him. He looked like some animal that had just lost its prey. He was holding something between his fingers that glittered in the last rays of sunshine. It was one of her scales. On one hand, she felt triumphant because she had escaped. But on the other hand, that feeling of being held close had changed everything for her. All those games which she used to lose herself in, all those safe little dreams on her favorite seashell, all those gentle lapping little waves in her dreamland, all gone, gone, gone as if they'd never been. Pushed and pulled along, she sped like an arrow into the depths where she thought the sea which would be. The force driving her was stronger than any fear of the water's massive weight and density. She raced along as if on a ghost train through the hollow passages of the cave palace until she came to a sudden halt. Directly in front of the witch. It could not have been anyone else. Those eyes glowed out of the dark waters, neither interested nor disinterested. The eyes saw everything, yet seemed infinitely unmoved by it all. The mermaid did not allow herself time for her fear and so she did not need to overcome it. She looked straight into her eyes and said, Legs for me. You know the price. I won't pay. Then no legs. Then you can't be a real witch. You must be just a silly old jealous hunchback, an ugly old trollop dealing in wishes and dreams. Pay the price? What price? Even if I wanted to, I could not pay. I'm not the Sea King's daughter. All right. You give me your voice, and I will give you legs. But I'm afraid I can't relieve you from the pain in your feet nor free you from the oath that you must marry before the year's end. Wrong. I need my voice and my feet too. And marriage? What's that all about? At that, the witch was completely astonished. Well then, what do you want legs for anyway, my dear little girl? Don't you call me your dear little girl. If you were a real witch, you'd know my answer. No reply. Just an ominous, leering grin that was echoed by every creature and object in the cave. A pervasive, clinging desire oozed out, leaving the words to melt seductively in her mouth. All right, then. Go on. Take what you want. Take everything. Just give me legs. At that very moment, 
she saw in front of her, like the twinkling of some distant star, the image of her fisherman as he kissed her glistening scale, singing, lost in his dreams. I dream of my love from afar. She is near me like a star. I don't want to live without her. Wind and waves flow on about her. The waves of our love, waves of my song, deep in her heart. legs because I just do. That's all. Because I haven't got any. Because I'm bored to tears here with nothing else to do all day than swim around in circles. Yes. I want to go where humans live. Deep in the dark holes of the witch's eyes there appeared a distant light. Genuine terror now rose within the mermaid, and she realized that the witch had begun to like her, and that made her feel sick and paralyzed inside. She would love to have escaped as quickly as she'd come. This was not the way she had imagined it would be. She could not tear her eyes away from the witches, and the longer she stared into them, the more she realized she was involved in a terrible battle, a battle against decay and oblivion, against all the failures and rejections that had ever been, against all the dark forces, and even against that pungently sweet desire of letting yourself drown in it all. The mermaid was moved in a strangely painful way, and in a helplessness touched the witch's shoulders, looking deep into her eyes, and it was all she could do but to beg. Please. Listen here, little mermaid. I'll let you go on land. I grant you your wish, yes. I'll exempt you from the pain. But there is one thing, little mermaid. It will be up to you to be strong enough to remain in my good grace and keep alive my faith in your good fortune. The mermaid did not detect the hidden threat in the granting of her wish. Nor could she really rejoice, for she had managed to get what she wanted so unexpectedly, so easily. Why are you letting me off so lightly? Well, it's good you're not overjoyed. I imagine I'll be quite entertained for a while watching you stumbling about in the land. Oh, so you just want to make fun of me? Nonsense! It just whiles away the time. Keeps my mind occupied, my dear. Each of you I've let go, with or without pain. With or without your voice, sooner or later. You've all bored me endlessly. And I soon gave up watching. Don't you know what happened to any of them? Oh yes, I certainly do. They all gave up on their own, let go of their dream, forgot their former tears of pleading. They always give up. They either become fat, faded and lazy, or bitter and withered. I sit here despising myself for even hoping that one of you might insist on defending your happiness, or at least your dream of it. 
But no. Nothing. Nothing. In the witch's eyes, echoes of light arose. The source of which the mermaid could only dare to guess had long been extinguished. The light spread through the darkness of the cave, just enough for one to perceive every detail. She observed strange objects that seemed to have a life of their own. A knot of intertwined snakes turned and twisted so rapidly that it appeared motionless. A mound of abandoned dreams piled high like dirty laundry, still compelling, still trembling. A rusty pot filled with tears cried in vain. The tears rose up, sobbing, and then dripped back down again in sad drops. A figure, neither alive nor dead, dragged along murmuring to itself in a barely comprehensible voice. began to cry. I don't want to go on land. I don't want to cause more sorrow. I can't. Exhausted, she sank into herself and into the witch's lap. The witch put her arms around her and rocked herself and the mermaid to sleep. Refreshed, the mermaid awoke. Please, try not to expect anything from me. I promise not to expect anything from people. I only want to be with them and get to know them. Just to be around them. And if I'm lucky, he will hold me tightly once again. And if he does, I should like to stay by his side. But I must be able to stay with him. And that is why you must give me legs. And everything a human needs. Upon waking up, the witch realized that she had received a gift. This had been the first sleep in centuries and seemed to have endowed her with a renewed ability to see herself differently. She found herself thinking aloud and laughed at herself. <laughs> yes, I actually went on land years ago with my fish tail. I let myself get caught by the one I loved and rather skillfully, so I thought. But then, I found it unbearable, being constantly gaped at like some prize catch. 
instead of being loved. I could not bear it. Thinking these thoughts, she inwardly distanced herself from the mermaid, who she surely would let go. Yes, but the old poison arose within her, in echoing waves of pain, the old desire to once again play with her own punishment. As a spider weaves its web in order to suck the life from its victim, she wanted to suck the innocence, the faith, the certainty of happiness from the mermaid. The witch wanted to somehow make the mermaid stumble at least once, almost in memoriam, to all those who had failed and hated themselves for it. At that very moment, the cave shook under the pressure of amassed water, and suddenly the dolphin was before the witch and said, Dare, dare to take the courage from her, to poison her joy, to fill her hope with doubt, and I will slay you here and now even if it is true that you are my mother. He had come threateningly near her. The mermaid tearfully threw herself between them. Let her be. She is not truly evil. She has done nothing to me. She is only infinitely sad. I've seen all the varieties of fear and despair. Let her be. Believe me. In all her many years of loneliness, the witch had never experienced anything of the kind. She had never even imagined the possibility. Someone had stood up for her. She felt once again connected to herself. Time, our gentle escort, has a good heart after all. My son, you need not have fear of me, nor do you need to feel ashamed of me. I have loved, and everything else has been forgiven. She handed him the knot of snakes. All my wisdom and all my silence I give to you. A tear of the mermaid's eye has fallen into my pot of tears, and that has opened my heart and the gates of forgiveness. As she spoke, light rose from the black depths of her eyes. The light glittered and sparkled ever nearer and stronger until the witch dissolved in it completely. Now, she was merely the reflecting surface in which the mermaid saw a young woman who she recognized to be herself. The mirror exuded light swallowing every sense of fear and doubt. Soon, she would be holding the one she loved. And so the dolphin carried his friend, now a young woman, on land. He felt not a trace of sadness or the pain of saying goodbye, for he understood as the new ruler of the sea, but he would always be able to be with her in her dreams. After all, they were friends. The mermaid found herself standing on her own legs. Next to her was a suitcase, somewhat in the form of her favorite seashell, containing everything a young woman might need. Love in all its varieties, patience, and plenty of self-confidence. 
He was, of course, on the last ship. She felt paralyzed by the happiness of seeing him. She could not speak a word, nor could she take a single step towards him. He jumped on land and started to walk in her direction. Suddenly he stopped right in front of her. Is it you? She answered, yes. He took her in his arms and said, 